Good morning, morning. and happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Pastor Dwight is gone, and I am here. (laughs) We met Pastor Dwight and his wife Karen two weeks ago, walking in St. Joe, and I told him that I was supposed to preach the the week after his last Sabbath, and that I was thinking of, of saying this. And he said, well, you should say it because it is very true. When you get get up to preach there, I will be gone and you will be there. It is an honor for me to stand before you today, class of 2023. Pastor Ferguson and staff, thank you for the opportunity. I remember he called. uh, We were with my wife, Paula, driving somewhere for meetings, and I received a phone call, and uh, it's Pastor Ferguson, and he asked me, you know, the committee thought of asking you to preach, and I was so focused, focused on my meeting that I said, you know what, let me think and pray about it and call you back, and so my wife says, so who called you, and, and I said, it was Pastor Ferguson, and what, what did he want, and I told her what uh, the conversation was all about, and, and she said, and you need to pray about this? Your daughter's graduation, of course you're going to preach. I called him right away and said, yeah, of course, yeah, I'm going to preach. (laughs) You know, class of 23, I just taught you a lesson right there about marriage. (laughs) This is a a, a weekend with uh, mixed emotions. I never thought that uh, Mr. Schreckhammer would make me cry. As he did this morning, it was very touching what he shared at Sabbath school. Mixed emotions, mixed feelings for you as a class, because you're excited, you're graduating, but also it's been the last, everything in the last few weeks. And you're leaving an amazing experience behind, and uh, you're moving on to something great, and I'm sure you will miss your friends, your parting ways with many of your friends. You're leaving behind mentors uh, that are more than teachers. And thank you, um, staff and teachers, because you have really ministered to our children. And I know I speak on behalf of all the parents here. Thank you so much. It is mixed emotions for us as parents as well. In some cases, the only child is leaving home. For some, is, is the firstborn. And I know what it means, the excitement of seeing your firstborn moving on to this important phase in life. For some, is the, like in our case, is the youngest child. And now we're officially empty nesters, trying to find out what that is all about. In some cases, is the middle child. And for them, good luck. I don't know anything about middle children, but but I know that your parents love you and and also have these mixed emotions. The uh, title that I've chosen for this message is Remember Your ID. Remember Your ID. The secret is on the wall. Let us pray. Father in heaven, As we spend some time together meditating on your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to each one of us. Lord, we give you all the honor and glory for all the good things in our lives. And we're here first and foremost to worship you for this accomplishment in the lives of our children. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There are times when your ID is everything. You know, I went for a walk with uh, Dr. Joseph Kidder. Many of you know him. You know that uh, he walks and prays with so many people. Uh, I know Tim, he walks and prays with you uh, and many others probably here. And he knew I had to preach for the Sabbath, and so he asked me, how is, is the message coming? And I shared with him the, the title, the working title I had at the time, and the main points I wanted to share, and he liked it immediately, and we started to talk about it, as we have done it so many times. And, uh, 
And then we finished. We had like everything I shared, and then he added a few things. And then he says, but, you know, now we need some stories to put some flesh to these bones. And I said, I agree, but we've been talking and walking for so long, so I, I'm not sure that we can do this today. And so he said, well, let's pray about it. And so we prayed. And that night at 2 in the morning, we receive a phone call. Now, I'm not saying that this is God orchestrating this, but it was interesting. Actually, uh, Miss Yvonne called me first, but I was so asleep that I didn't hear. And so my wife wakes me up and says, Ger Gerardo, wake up, wake up. You know, and I don't know how long it took for her to wake me up. And then when I'm half awake, she says, it's Fio. She's calling from Germany. And what? You know, and kind of slowly the thoughts came to my mind. Oh, that's right. They're coming back from the Reformation tour. And they're somewhere in Germany in transit. And then I could hear Fia's voice. And she was very tense, very stressed. She was trying to... Uh, act calm as if everything is kind of okay and she's with this soft voice but you can, you can tell that she's so nervous you know they can't let they're not letting me uh, board the plane and, and, and go with the group I said what what's going on well I have my password they said that I don't have a green card I, we know that you don't have a green card yet but we're here with a work visa and, and you have a paper well I don't have the paper with me now, until today, we have not pressed charges. We don't know, you know, who was responsible for those papers. But we could hear the tension. Then we see, we hear Miss Yvonne just standing next, next to her. And I don't know where you are, Miss Yvonne, but thank you for being such a great mentor to our daughter, uh, Fio. And she said, I'm not going anywhere. And the thought is, well, the only place you can go is Canada because you have a Canadian passport. And the guy was very serious. And I'm already thinking, well, now we need to get a ticket to Toronto somewhere. And then I need to call, you know, our, our, my in-laws and let them know that maybe they'll have to go and pick her up and whatnot. And, and so eventually, you know, one of the things Yvonne said, Miss Yvonne said, is just, well, you just pray. And they hung up. And then we prayed. And then a few minutes later, she said, we're on the plane. Amen. Now you see, fear's here. There are times when your ID is everything. You cannot go home if you don't have your ID. And just having your ID is not enough. You need to have proof of your ID. Just saying you have it is not enough. There are times when your ID is everything, and class of 2023, I think that this issue of identity has been uh, at the core of the great controversy from the very beginning. But more than ever today is such a critical issue. And so today I just want to remind you and remind us all, and if you're watching online and if you came to worship and, and you're not directly related to cl the class of 2023, just, just stay for a few moments because maybe God has something uh, for you as well. But the question I have for you is, what determines your ID? Here you have a driver's license. Is it your address? Is it the state where you're from? Is it your height? Is it your sex? What determines your ID? Is it your face? Can you ever thought, can you ever, did you ever imagine how your identity would change if your face changed? Maybe you heard recently Brad Pitt um, underwent surgery to change, to improve his face. I don't know if you've heard of that. And really, I think that it worked. This is a new face. <laughs> An improved identity. <laughs> but seriously though, what, what, how would your life change? Is that what determines who you are? People invest tons of money 
to do plastic surgery because they think their identity, their life will change if they improve their face like Brad Pitt. <laughs> Let me remind you that the secret of your ID is on the wall. You have seen it, hopefully, every day of these last four years as you walked into AA. And here's the picture, he's on the wall. To restore in man the image of his maker is the object of education. And actually that is taken from a quote from the book of education that reads, to restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul, that the divine purpose and I want to highlight that word purpose, the divine purpose in his creation might be realized this. And I want you to, to really think about that. This, this was the work, this was to be the work of redemption. This is what Christ came to do. And this is or should be the object of life. You are moving on to a new phase in your lives, college. Some of you will become engineers. Some of you will become teachers, nurses, doctors. Some of you are thinking of working at NASA, I hear. And those are all great dreams. May God bless you and use you. But there is something that is above and beyond, something that unites us all the main, the biggest object of life, and that is to be transformed back into the image of God. And so when we talk about ID today, we talk about three things. Of course, we talk about identity. We also talk about intended destiny. We just read in the quote, the purpose, God's purpose for your life, the object your intended destiny, and of course, we talk about Imago Dei, which in Latin means the image of God. We read in Genesis 1.27, so God created mankind, mankind in his own image. In the image of God, Imago Dei, he created them, male and female, he created them. There are a few things before I leave with you four points, class of 2023. So much has been written on this. But most scholars, most, most theologians agree on some basic notions around the image of God. First, that the image means reflection. It means that we were created to reflect God in some way. Now, that's where when we go into the specifics, there, there's different opinions. But I think it is so important for you to be reminded that you were wonderfully and fearfully made. That your identity is tied to something much deeper than just how you look or your past or your family or where you live, if you have a great house or, 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 or not a great house. That your identity is tied to God himself. That the creator of the universe thought of you. Secondly, Scholars agree today that was not necessarily in the past. In the past, even this concept of the image of God was used to abuse other people. For example, that certain races are more in the image of God than other races. That is not the case today. All were made in the image of God. So when we say that we were created, that we is a big we. All of you, all of us created in the image of God. But also, most scholars agree that the image of God in us was affected by sin. Now, we could pause here and talk for a long time about this. Because sometimes we hear arguments about certain topics. Well, if God made me like this, well, but if you go to Scripture, the way we are now is not exactly how God made us. Yes, He loves us, absolutely. But sin has affected all of us. 
That's what Paul says. That's what the Bible says. So, so our thoughts, our tendencies, our propensities have been affected by sin. And yet, we can give glory to God because Christ, as we read just a few moments ago, came down and he became like us to restore what he created at the beginning. So the main purpose of the plan of salvation is really a work of restoration. Number five, especially in the New Testament, scholars agree that the image of God equals Jesus Christ. So if you want to somehow learn more about this crucial issue in Scripture, if you really take this seriously, class of 2023, and you say, yes, this, I'm going to make this the object of my life, then I would say, spend time with Christ. Spend time looking at Jesus Christ. Our world needs less of us, less of the church even, and more of Christ. But of course, I'm not separating the church from Christ because the Bible says that the church is the body of Christ. But we need to look at the head of the body. And number six, restoration of the image of God is the supreme goal. This is what we're here for. This is what, it, what the church is here for. This is what the, our schools are here for. And so... I'm going to share with you the class motto here. They chose the following from Roosevelt. The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. Do you like that? Well, Enoch E. on the yearbook wrote on success, and he says, success is defined by how big your dream is and what you do with it. And so... I suggest to you a little bit of a modified version of your motto and say the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of God's dream for them. And God's dream for you is to restore His image in your life. That is a beautiful dream to pursue. And so the main thought today that I want to share with all of us, but especially with you, class of 2023, is that Christ is both our shared identity and our shared intended destiny. In Him we are, and in Him we are being transformed into the image of God. I wish we had more time just to pause here and just think about it. When Paul says that we are in Christ, it means that already because he is the image of God. And he came to restore that even if I am a work in progress, already I am hidden in Christ. And God, see, God sees God the Father, sees Christ in us so that we are already in Christ as the image of God. And yet still... As we walk with Him, as we allow the Spirit to work in us, then more and more His character, His life is being transformed in, in our lives. And more and more we reflect the love of God, the character of Christ in us. And again, I want to suggest to you that there is no more beautiful dream to pursue than that. I want to share from a text, again, so much could be said about the image of God, so many things, but the secret is on the wall. And I want to share this text, and out of this text, four points, and then we'll close and we'll go home. Philippians 2, verses 5 to 9, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God counted not the being on an equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, talking about Christ. And again, we're saying, if you want to pursue this dream, look at Christ. 
Christ emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men, and being found in, the, in fashion as a man. He humbled himself, becoming obedient even unto death. Yea, the death of the cross, wherefore also God highly exalted him and gave unto him the name which is above every name. And we pause here. Let me share with you four ways. If you want to pursue this dream, four things we can do based on this text. Number one, here it is. Think deeply. Think deeply. We just read, it says, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ. You know, spirituality, biblical spirituality is a thing of the mind. And of course, uh, we have this holistic view of humanity, as we were reminded yesterday. Uh, and everything is important, but it includes certainly the mind. By the way, I sent this yesterday, and I didn't know what uh, Gianluca and Silvia were going to talk about, and you would see a few things that connect, and maybe the Spirit was behind what we were doing. A thing of the mind, and I read here Enzo's quote. Enzo, where are you? I don't know. There you are, the one you chose. He chose this quote for the yearbook. He wrote, you have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this, and you will find strength. Interesting quote. Paul also talks about the mind, not just in Philippians, and he said, and we heard it last night as well, do not conform to the pattern, pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So I would add to Enzo's, Enzo's quote, or the, the quote he chose, yes, we have power because we have our will, but we don't have the power to renew our mind, we need the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, very often, when we see the word heart, it's talking about the mind, right? For example, Genesis 6, 5 says, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. There are so many texts that we could share. Two more. First Kings 10.24 says the whole world sought audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had put where? In his heart. It's talking about the mind. And then, of course, the, 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 the verse you chose as a class where it reads, Proverbs 16.19, In the hearts, human plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. So again, very often when you see the heart in, in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, it's talking about the mind. And so, you know, in, in, in our thinking, in the Western culture, usually we think of, of the mind, the brain as the mind, and then the heart for feelings. So when you say, I love you with all my heart, right? Well, usually in Hebrew, you have to go one level down. So you would say the heart is the mind, and the bowels, that's where you have your feelings, your emotions, now, guys, please never say to a girl, I love you with all my bowels, okay? <laughs> That's not going to work very well in our culture. A thing of the mind, a ma matter of the mind. Think deeply. Let me share a few points before I move into the other three ways in which we can pursue God's dream. To me at least, for me at least, to think deeply, class of 2023, is to think for yourself. Think for yourself. I am convinced that one of the greatest temptations ever, but especially today, is to follow what somebody else is thinking. Think for yourself. And I have here the motto of the Royal Society in Latin, nullius verba, which means... Take nobody, nobody's word for it. Yes, of course you can listen. Of course you can hear what other people think. But think for yourself. That's what God wants. God doesn't want you just to do the actions, the religious actions. He wants you to think for yourself and to follow because you have chosen for yourself. You know, recently I saw this post. And by the way, I asked for permission to share this from uh, uh, Dr. Oliver Glanz where, you know, he was doing what uh, all of us have been doing for the last four years with our children, right, parents? They were translating a quote from Immanuel Kant from 
Germany, from, from German to English. Theo will be doing that every, week, every night at home, right? Wrong. Interesting, father-daughter sitting at the kitchen table translating this text from the Enlightenment, and it reads as follows, written by uh, Immanuel Kant. Enlightenment is the departure of a person from his self-inflicted immaturity. Interesting. Leaving immaturity behind. Immaturity, says Kant, is the inability to make use of one's own reason without direction of another. In other words, if you're immature, you're going to continue forever. I'm going to follow. Okay, you think that? Okay, I think that's cool. That's it. And Kant says, actually, if you want to live in maturity behind, then you, at some point, you need to start using reason for yourself. Self-inflicted is this immaturity when the cause of it lies not in the lack of the capacity to think with reason. It's not that you cannot think for yourself, but of a lack of resolution and a courage to make use of it without the direction of another. And let me tell you something, class of 2023. It doesn't matter where you go for college, Adventist or non-Adventist. There will be many voices trying to guide your convictions. Think for yourself. And then the quote says, Sapere aude, dare to know. Have the courage to make use of your reason. Is that the motto of the enlightenment? You know, there, is a, 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 there are verses in Scripture, uh, I think I put it up and I'll share it later from Proverbs, that encourage us to do exactly that. But here is the interesting reflection that Dr. Glanz then shares in this post. This is now he reacting to this quote. He says, laziness and cowardice are the causes why such a great amount of human beings... Long after nature, um, sorry, long after, a na uh, after nature emancipated them from other people's direction, he says, nevertheless, gladly remain immature throughout the rest of their lives. And why become so easy for others to set themselves up as their guardians? It is so comfortable, he says, to be an immature. If I have a book that has reason for me, a pastor who has a conscience for me, a doctor who decides on a diet for me, and so on, then I need not trouble myself at all. Now, of course, they're not saying we shouldn't consult others. That's not the point. But the point is that you are responsible, that you have to think for yourself, and that you have to make choices about what you think and who you follow. Think for yourself. Number two, think biblically. It's okay to hear, you know, some things from the Enlightenment, but we should go back a little bit further and look at the Reformation. And some of you went on the Reformation tour. It's not just think for your, yourself, thinking independently from God, but actually look at God's Word and make that the base of your thinking. Psalm 4, 8 says, I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. Amen. Psalm 119, I have hidden your Word in my heart. And we said already what the heart means. You know, uh, a few of you received the Andrews Award. And Andrews was known for many things. And they say that he could recite the New Testament by heart, by memory. Know God's Word and memorize it and internalize it. Because in time of trouble, like when Jesus was tempted, that's what will keep you going in the right direction. Think biblically. Proverbs 3.1, my son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. And then Jeremiah, I love this one, 31, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. And he says, I will put my law where? In your minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people as we internalize God's teachings and words as part of us, of our thinking. Yes, think for yourself, but of course, think biblically. I would add, think spiritually. You know, I believe the devil knows God's word, but I don't know that he thinks spiritually as we should think spiritually. And that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, 
And he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. And then Ezekiel 11, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from, uh, from them their heart of stone and give them a heart or mind of flesh, a mind that is open to the guidance of the spirit. Think for yourself, absolutely. Think biblically, yes, but also think spiritually. And sometimes and often we need to pray with David, created me a pure heart, a pure mind, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Lastly, think like Christ. And in Philippians 2, some versions read, have this mind or have this attitude of Christ. Because the more we choose for ourselves to follow the Bible, guided by the Spirit, the more we're going to think like Christ. And Christ had an attitude of humility. He says, some, we could define humility as the willingness to give up my will and privilege for another's good to accomplish what is best. And that is why Paul says in Philippians that Jesus did not consider his equality with God being of the same nature because he is God, a privilege to be grasped. But he says he was willing to let that go so that he could come and rescue us from sin. Philippians, same book, same letter. Paul says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honorable, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, and whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think of these things. Think for yourself. Think deeply. The second one is live fully. Seth Shelley, where are you? This is what you chose to define success. And Seth writes, success is living one's life to the fullest. But the question is, what does that mean? How does one live life to the fullest? And again, you're going to hear all kinds of agendas to suggest what living life to the fullest means. I want to suggest to you that we find the answer in Scripture. Jesus says that He came so that we can have life and life abundantly. And then in Philippians 2, 7, he writes, Paul writes, Christ emptied Himself. This sounds like an oxymoron. In order to have life to the fullest, we need to empty ourselves. Because it is not so much about self, but the opposite. It's about forgetting self so that we can focus on the good of others. And yes, God may bless you as you pursue your dreams, your careers, and you may become wealthy, and that is all okay if the Lord leads you there, as long as you have the mind of Christ and you have this thought of living fully, which means to empty of self to bless others. To live fully like Jesus is to live not for self, but to empty self and live for others. My friend, Pastor Rudy Alvear, some of you may know him, um, flew to South Bend a few years, this is a good number of years ago, and someone went to pick him up. It was a, an Old Testament uh, student, I believe. And so P Rudy, Pastor Rudy, you know, he loves to ask questions all the time, questions and questions. You know, I, the last time I saw him, it was at the call convention last year, and he came, and again, he asked me questions. Hey, what, are, what is your dissertation about? How about this, and how about that? And, and so he asked this uh, Old Testament student, so let me ask you something. Does God humiliate us, or does he make us humble? Whatever he meant by that question. But he said, you know, let me think about it. And they continued driving for about 10 minutes, and then this Old Testament student said, actually, I think you're asking the wrong question. You're concerned about whether what God does to you, but you should think about what God chose to do himself, to humble himself for us. I love that. He emptied himself. Do you want to live life to the fullest, class of 2023? Then I would say, empty yourself like Christ so that we can become a blessing for others. I love, I love Madison Whitman's quote in the yearbook. She says, How can we expect righteousness to prevail when there is hardly anyone willing to give himself up individually to a righteous cause? 
I love it. Thank you, Madison. Are you willing to give yourself up for a righteous cause? We are Seventh-day Adventists and we believe that Jesus is coming soon. We don't know how soon, but we have to be careful not to think, oh, the Lord tarries. He is coming. And this is the time where we need a generation that will choose to give themselves up for a righteous cause. Thirdly, serve unconditionally. Philippians 2 7 says that Christ took the form of a servant. We read in Matthew that even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here's a quote that maybe you've read before Not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. And that is really what changes the world. Look, you wrote your definition of success. You said success is having the freedom and the ability to help others. I love it. Success to serve others. You know, I heard a story recently. Pastor uh, Craig shared this happened a few years ago. It was a long day of, of meetings. And him with a group of pastors were tired and hungry. And so they went to a restaurant, maybe a Wendy's or something like that. It was late at night. That was the only thing that they found. And they noticed there was a waiter. He was kind of different, a distinguished person. The way he walked, the way he, you know, moved, the way he came and he talked. He had a South African accent and very polished. And he was curious immediately. So he waited a little bit. And when he, the waiter came the second time, uh, he said, excuse me, but I noticed a South African accent. Is that correct? And he said, yes. How long have you been here in the U.S.? And he says, I think it was maybe five years. Okay. And if I may ask, what, what did you do back home in, in South Africa? And he said, I was the CEO of a very successful company. And he said, but as the more I... I worked hard, and, and I forgot who I was. And I lost my wife, and I lost my family, and eventually I lost my job, and I lost everything. And so I decided to come to the U.S. to start all over again. And so Pastor Craig asked him, and so, I mean, what is your plan? Are you planning to move on eventually, to go back to something similar? And he said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to remain serving tables because this job reminds me of God's purpose for my life, that I'm here to serve people. Now, I'm not saying that you would go home today, class of 2023, and said, I'm inspired by the sermon. I'm not going to pursue medicine. I'm going to work at a restaurant serving tables. <laughs> Your parents may have a heart attack. But what I'm saying is that if you want to pursue God's dream of becoming more like Christ, service has, be, has to be part of your identity. Yes. Yes. Lastly, trust God completely. Amen. Philippians 2.8 says, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient even unto death, the death of the cross. Because the way you show that you trust anyone is by following their commands. Peter Forsyth was right when he wrote, The first duty of every soul is to find not his freedom, but his master. Interesting quote. And some of us may not like it, but actually we all serve something or someone. And that's why I love how Hong An Kim defines success. Success is knowing what you love. Because actually what you love becomes your master. Think about that just for a second. But Christ came and humbled himself and emptied himself to live like a man. And he chose to obey his Father all the way, even to the cross. I love this. 
anonymous poem that says, Trust Him when dark doubts assail thee. Trust Him when thy strength is small. Trust Him when to simply trust Him seems the hardest thing of all. Trust Him, He is ever faithful. Trust Him, for He will, His will is best. Trust Him, for the heart of Jesus is the only place of rest. You may have seen blind skiers. I don't know if you've seen that before. But usually around the Olympics, sometimes they show how they train. And basically, blind skiers that do slalom skiers, ski, they follow. They're paired with a sighted skier. And so first, what they do is that they uh, are taught on the flats how to turn, right turn, left turn, and when they master that, then they're taken to the slalom slope where their sighted partners uh, skier. They, 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 they ski beside them and they shout, left, sorry, left is this way, left. And they just, because they've learned to follow, they can't see anything. Imagine that, they're going down high speed, but they hear left and they go left, they don't see. And then right, and they go right. And that's how they can complete the race and cross the finish line. And let me tell you something. I think that this is a beautiful illustration of the Christian life. Because more often than not, we cannot see what's ahead of us. But that's when we need to trust our Father, like Jesus. And He's kneeling there, thinking of you, thinking of me. And He's saying, Father... I don't want to do this, if possible, but not my will. I cannot see ahead of me. I'm suffering. Complete trust. Someone sent me this note not too long ago, my friend Nestor, who's moving. And at the time, he wasn't sure what the future had in store for, for them and the family. And said, God, I have no idea where you are taking me, but I trust you. And some of you have no, have no idea where God is taking you, but trust God. He loves you. He has a plan for you, and He will lead you if you lean on Him. Four ways to pursue God's dream. Think deeply. Live fully. Serve unconditionally. Trust God completely. The secret is on the wall. You have seen it on the out, outer wall of AA. And I wanted to share this so that every time you come back to your class reunion, you will remember your identity. No matter how low you are at that time or how high successful in life, remember that you have a dream, that God has a dream for you, and His dream is to restore His image in your life. I told Nate that I was going to quote him, and he looked at me with uh, this face. I think he was scared. He didn't know how I was going to quote him. But Nate, you, your quote, the quote you chose for the yearbook says, The final forming of a person's character lies in their own hands. Your aim is to put our dreams in our hearts, in our hearts, in God's hands. Yes, yes. And again, I want to modify your aim a little bit to put God's dreams in our hearts, in our hearts, in God's hands. I want to close by showing a picture. It's going to be hard. to move past this picture without being moved. This is Theo's grandfather. My dad passed away two years ago. Theo, your granddad would be proud of you if you were watching from South America. But my father passed away. He had Alzheimer's. So I know 
I know the pain of seeing a loved one forget their identity. And I remember when being away, we would gather as a family, and he started to forget things, simple things. I remember one day, it was Christmas, and there were other people around, and I overheard my father asking, who is that, who is that man, young man? And he was asking for me. But praise be to God that God never forgets our identity. That my father rests in our father's heart. And so class, I want to end with an appeal. God has brought you through the last four years, the last 12 years of education. We're here to celebrate what God has done in you and through you. But also, I'm here to remind you that God has a dream for you. And if I were to ask the parents of every student to say, give some advice, they wouldn't say just, oh, study hard and, you know, be successful with a business. Probably all of them, number one, would say, follow Christ all the way to the end. So I'm going to ask you the question, class of 2023. If you want to take this moment right now, right here, in front of everybody, and say, Lord, I don't know the plans you have for me, but today, right now, with my classmates and my friends, I want to choose afresh to follow Christ. If you want to do that, would you stand for prayer? Praise the Lord. This is the greatest dream you can pursue. One day I look forward to seeing my dad again. that day I hope you're there as well and church what do you say would you like to take this moment right now and join the class of 2023 and say today Lord I want to choose to pursue God's dream until Jesus comes if you want to do that please stand where you are Let us pray. Father in heaven, we praise you today because we know that the answer to our toughest questions is found in nobody else but Jesus Christ. Who left heaven, who emptied himself who lived a full life by emptying himself and serving others and follow your voice father all the way to the end father we stand before you right now and we take this moment to consecrate our lives our hearts our minds our bodies and everything so that you can touch us and bless us some of these students are going to go to difficult environments May your spirit go with them and prepare the way for them. May your angels surround them and bless them and, and, and serve them. All of us as a church, we stand before you right now when we surrender our hearts and our lives to you. And we do everything in the precious and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.